Welcome back to Aurora Tech Channel. Today, I will review the Ideaformer IR3V2, which is a clipper-based conveyor belt printer. Previously, I reviewed a few different belt printers and DIY upgrade kits. As they are all Marlin-based, the problem is they print slowly. I just don't have the patience to wait for days to print a long model. But this clipper-based IR3V2 may change the game. Ideaformer will launch a Kickstarter campaign on the 25th of this month, and the flash sale price is $499. It sounds like a really good deal, so let's take a look at what you can get from this printer. The print volume is 250mm by 250mm by infinite, and the kinematics are Core XZ. The gantry serves as the X and Z axis, and the conveyor belt serves as the Y axis. As a result, you can print unlimited length objects and do batch production without needing to remove prints manually. The motion system uses linear rails and linear rods on the gantry. The textured PEI belt with a maximum temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. The base is formed by 80-20 extrusions with large metal rollers. The extruder has 5 to 1 gear ratio metal gears. The hot end is a high flow copper hot end with a titanium alloy tube. The heater is an 85 watt heater, and the nozzle is similar to an MK8 that can reach a maximum temperature of 300 degrees Celsius, but is customized for 45 degree printing. The print head is using CAN bus, so there is only one cable from the motherboard, and all components like the fans, hot end, thermistor, and accelerometer are controlled by another STM MCU. The firmware is the open source clipper. It uses a 4.3 inch touchscreen that runs the standard clipper screen UI with a fluid web interface that allows you to control the printer and send prints over the network. The Wi Fi module supports both 2.4 GHz and 5.8 GHz, and there's also an Ethernet port. There are two USB ports for you to print offline with a USB drive and plug in a webcam to monitor the print, which is also included. The motherboard is a standard clipper motherboard with an ARM quad-core 1.5GHz processor, 1GB of RAM, and the OS and firmware were installed on a 32GB micro SD card. For the Kickstarter price of around $500, it seems like a pretty good deal. I would like to thank Ideaformer for sending us this machine and for sponsoring today's video. Even though this is a sponsored video, we will offer an unbiased review and won't hesitate to point out any cons. With that said, let's get started. The printer arrived in one large box. The top layer contains some accessories and the gantry, while the second layer holds the base. The build of this belt printer is similar to a regular bed slinger, with a conveyor belt as the base and a gantry. It includes a 4.3 inch touchscreen, a USB webcam, brackets to reinforce the gantry, cables, a spool holder, sample filament, and tools. Like a bed slinger, we need to mount the gantry on top of the base, but in this case, the gantry is positioned at a 45 degree angle instead of 90 degrees. A bracket needs to be installed to reinforce it. It's a good idea to use a speed square to check if the gantry is exactly 45 degrees before tightening all the screws. Do the same to the other side. Next, mount the spool holder, connect the filament sensor, the cable, and the Bowden tube to the extruder, and finally mount the screen at the front. If desired, you can also plug in the USB webcam on the side of the screen. Now, we can turn on the machine. The good news is that it uses the standard clipper interface, so there's no confusion like with other so-called self-developed UIs. First, I'll home the machine and ensure all the cables are connected. As you can see, it uses a strain gauge and the nozzle to probe the bed for homing. I will then perform auto bed leveling. Since the belt printer prints on a single line, it only needs to probe 6 points. After that, I'll calibrate the input shaper using one of the preset macros. The print head will shake for about 7-8 to eight minutes before saving the results and restarting. Then, I'll connect the printer to my Wi-Fi network so we can use the Fluid Web interface to control the printer and upload G-code files. This Wi-Fi module supports both 2.4GHz and 5.8GHz networks. Once the IP address is assigned, we can load filament and start our first print. The slicer used is Idea Maker from Raise 3D. They've provided the printer profile and some filament profiles on the included USB drive, which you can easily import into the slicer. 
Let's look at the PLA profile. The top speed is set to 300 mm per second, and the acceleration is set to 6,000 to 8,000 mm per second squared, which is pretty fast. For the bed temperature, I set it to 75 degrees Celsius instead of 65 degrees Celsius, as belt printers print at 45 degrees, and the first layer may not stick as well as with a 90 degree printer. So, I generally set the bed temperature a bit higher. Now let's start with the Benchy. On a belt printer, you can't print a Benchy in the standard orientation since anything above a certain line will be considered overhanging. I'll rotate it 90 degrees and print it from that angle so that only a small section is overhanging. Let's check the preview. Besides that small part, there's an area near the top that's going to print in mid-air. This line will fail, but instead of adding support, I'll just trim it off. This is unavoidable unless you rotate the Benchy 45 degrees and add a support base. Since the slicer only supports raised 3D machines for direct network printing, I will save the file and upload it through the Fluid Web interface. It only takes a few seconds, and then we can start the print. The Z offset is set automatically during homing, so we don't need to adjust it manually. The printer starts with a long purge line to help the first layer stick better. As expected, the overhanging section doesn't have the best surface quality, but that's typical for belt printers compared to standard 90 degree printers. The sound level of this printer is not quiet, but not too loud. It stays in the high 50s most of the time, and during rapid movements, it jumps to a little over 60 decibels. When it reaches the area printing in mid-air, the line drops as expected. It took 46 minutes using the standard profile from the slicer, which is in line with other clipper machines, printing at around 250 mm per second. Apart from the 45 degree lines, which look a bit weird, the surface quality is comparable to other clipper printers. The overhanging section doesn't have the best surface quality. The bottom stuck perfectly, and there are no extrusion issues at the top. Overall, everything worked as expected. When I tested the IR3V1 last year, I printed a 500 mm long Titanic. It was pretty cool, but it took a little over 24 hours. I'm gonna print the same model at the same size using the same 0.3 mm layer height as last time to see how much faster we can print it now. I will start with the tiny front of the ship. And this model is ideal for printing at 45 degrees since there won't be any overhanging requiring support.
It took 11 hours and 17 minutes to finish, more than twice as fast. The ship was printed beautifully. The details on the sides and top are clear. There are some tiny objects on the stern deck, but they still turned out well without support. Removing support from these small areas would probably be harder than just trimming off the strings. Overall, I'm very happy with the result. It even looks a little nicer compared to the 24-hour version printed on the Marlin version of the same machine. The bottom also stuck perfectly. I realized I was using 10% infill on the 24-hour print, so if I print this new one with 10% infill instead of 15%, it could be even faster. Next, I printed a long sign. I added simple text and made it 1 meter long, using a 0.3mm layer height with only 10% infill. The estimated time for this 1 meter sign was 14 hours and 13 minutes. The preview looked fine with no overhanging, so I started the print. When printing the 500mm Titanic, the belt could still hold the print when it reached the end. However, for this 1 meter long print, I will add a set of rollers, which is an optional accessory. It's the same as the one used in their previous model, and it sold for around $80. The filament ran out just as the print was almost finished, pausing in the middle of the final letter, M. Since I wasn't monitoring the printer, it paused for about 2.5 hours before I swapped in a new spool and resumed. The total print time ended up being 16 hours and 49 minutes, including the pause. When I checked the actual printing time in the web interface, it showed 13 hours and 51 minutes, which was slightly faster than the estimated 14 hours and 13 minutes. From a distance, it looks fine and the text is clear, but when viewed from the left, you can see that the starting walls weren't printed perfectly. One reason for the issue was that the cooling for PLA was too strong, so I decided to print another sign using PETG. This time, I made it 856mm long, about 15% shorter than the previous one. I set the volumetric speed for PETG to 15mm3 per second and reduced the cooling to 20%. I'm hoping this will improve the print quality of the walls. The estimated print time is 13 hours and 11 minutes. The walls turned out better, though still not perfect, but at least each line stuck properly. I will let it finish and compare it to the PLA print. It finished in exactly 13 hours and 11 minutes, which closely matched the estimate. The PETG surface isn't as smooth as the PLA, but when zooming in, you can see that the new walls on the PETG print look better. However, for a sign this long, you're unlikely to inspect it with the macro lens, and from a distance, both prints look fine. 
One of the advantages of a conveyor belt printer is its ability to handle batch production without needing to manually remove the object from the bed. I decided to test this by printing a PETG pen holder. This tire stack pen holder design doesn't require support on a regular 90 degree printer, but since all the gaps between the tires would be overhanging when printing at 45 degrees, support might be necessary. So I decided to print a few versions, the first with no rotation, the second rotated at 15 degrees, the third at 30 degrees, and the last at 45 degrees. Let's see how the quality improves as the rotation approaches 45 degrees. As expected, the one printer with no rotation turned out poorly, as the overhanging the unsupported walls looked bad. While this might be acceptable on a regular 90 degree printer, it was awful at 45 degrees. The second print, rotated at 15 degrees, looked better, but the gaps between the tires still weren't great. The third at 30 degrees looked much closer to a normal print, though still not perfect. Finally, the run rotated at 45 degrees produced a result very similar to what I was aiming for. The print finished in 14 hours and 50 minutes, so each pen holder took about 3 hours and 42 minutes. The first print was unusable, but as the rotation approached 45 degrees, the surface quality improved. Comparing the one rotated at 45 degrees to a regular 90 degree printer, the quality isn't far off. However, you'll still need to remove support and won't get as smooth a bottom as on a regular printer. I printed another 45 degree rotated one with PLA and it turned out beautifully. The supports were easier to remove as they stayed on the bed and I could just snap the pen holder off. However, you still need to touch up the bottom after removing the supports. I also printed a dragon model with PETG and scaled it up to 500 millimeters in length. This print took 18 hours and 48 minutes to finish, and it turned out awesome. The head, body, tail, and even the bottom were all printed beautifully, so I have no complaints about this print. Let's talk about the pros and cons of this machine, starting with the pros. 1. The build quality of this machine is solid and the assembly is easy. It's not any harder than putting a regular bed slinger together. 
With this new version with auto leveling and auto Z offset, you don't really need to manually level the belt and adjust the limit switch like on the previous version, as well as most other belt printers in the market. Two, the print speed is fast. It's two to three times faster than other Marlin based belt printers, and it's the first one in the market. Three, the cooling is also strong. At first, I wasn't sure that these two 4010 blowers would be good enough when printing at high speeds, but it turns out they are turbo blowers. The airflow is much stronger than regular blowers at the same size. The pushing force of the extruder is strong, and the copper hot end with that 85 watt heater is melting filament fast enough to keep up with the speed. With a hardened steel nozzle that can reach a maximum temperature of 300 degrees Celsius, and the textured PEI belt with a maximum temperature of 90 degrees Celsius. It can print a wide range of materials. I saw the testing video from Idea Former on their Kickstarter page, and it looks like they've also made an enclosure for ABS printing. Five, the PEI belt is working great. When printing small objects, the default profile of 65 degrees Celsius isn't enough, but once I raised it to 75 degrees Celsius, I didn't have any failed prints. Even though for printing a 45 degree tilted model, it sticks very well from beginning to end. I can just snap the model off the support materials, which still stick well to the bed when it's hot. Six, it uses standard Clipper firmware, Clipper screen, and the Fluid Web interface instead of making their own self-developed UI. I personally like to see manufacturers use standard firmware and UI unless they have something super innovative that the default firmware isn't able to do. Seven, the Wi-Fi module supports both 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz networks. When the print gets bigger, the G-code file size also gets larger. When using a 5.8 gigahertz network, I can still upload a large over 100 megabyte file within seconds. This is better than most other printers on the market, which only support 2.4 gigahertz networks, which was an old standard that came up more than 20 years ago. Now for the cons. One. Some parts like the filament sensor housing and the fan duct are 3D printed. The screen housing and the brackets are also not the best, and the cable is too long. The USB webcam also has no place to mount. I would like to see these places be improved before mass production. Two, the slicer profiles aren't well tuned. And since this printer prints at a 45 degree angle, I'm not sure if we can adjust the PLA cooling level only when it starts printing unsupported walls to help them stick better. I didn't notice the same issue with PETG as I set the cooling to 20% for everything. I also saw one of the tests that Ideaformer ran at their factory, and it seems to print straight walls with pretty good quality. I hope to see more well-tuned filament profiles ready to use when the final product is released. Three, the idea maker is an open source slicer. It currently only supports printing over the network with raised 3D printers. For other printers, you need to export the G-code file to your hard drive and drag it to the Fluid Web interface. It's not that big of a deal as it only requires a few extra clicks, but it would be better to be able to send the print directly from the slicer. Four, this is a Kickstarter campaign. So like all other campaigns on the platform, you pay upfront and expect to receive the printer a few months later. Unlike buying a ready-to-ship printer, various things could happen during this period. This machine is their third belt printer, following the original IR3 and IR3 V1. While campaigns from established companies are generally more likely to succeed, there are still risks you may want to consider. In conclusion, I'm super excited about the IR3 V2. I reviewed a few belt printers and DIY upgrade kits in the past, but I ended up not using them very often, mainly because of the slow print speeds. I just don't have the patience to wait for days instead of hours for a large print. This clipper-based belt printer could change the game. Their Kickstarter flash sale and early bird price is around $500, which really sounds like a good deal. I honestly doubt I could source all the parts and hardware to build a printer like this for that price. The performance is pretty good right out of the box, even as a prototype. I look forward to seeing how they fine-tune the slicer and address the small details I mentioned in the con section when the final product is released. If you're interested in getting this belt printer at the Kickstarter price, I've included the link in the description. As always, definitely do your own research to decide if this product is worth backing and be sure you understand the risks involved with Kickstarter campaigns. Please also check out my website, auroratechchannel.com, which monitors the prices of over 150 popular 3D printers, laser engravers, and CNC machines, as well as my recommendation list. 
That's it for this video. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time.